my club, the Club West Ham, is a great, great club. And what I would always say about them is that we were one of the first clubs in England to play three black players at the same time. Mm-hmm. It was Eddie Coker, Clive Charles, and myself. And for, look, funny enough, we all ended up playing in the NASL. Indeed. And um, we, you know, we took it in a stride. You know, we knew what to expect. You know, and um, it's like um, when Eddie first played his game, you know, I used to tell him, you know, the way to silence the crowd is to put the ball into the back of the net. And if you do something brilliant and you you put the ball in the back of the net, what could they say? They ain't going to say nothing to you, you know. So that's what we try to do. And in lots of cases, we did do that, you know. And um, as I say, you've got to be big. You've got to be strong. If they get on top of you, they're winning, aren't they? So you just got to continue playing and doing what you can because at the end of the day, the game has to be the winner. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, gang, thanks for joining me. Tim Hanlon here, indeed. This is Good Seats Still Available, that curious little podcast that's devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Can't thank you enough for giving us a listen. If it's your first time, welcome. Uh, If you're a longtime listener, uh, we welcome you as well. Um, today, we are uh, spending some time on uh, professional soccer in the United States with uh, one of the more notable players uh, from the 1970s and early 1980s across both the old North American Soccer League outdoor and indoor circuits, as well as the indoor major indoor soccer league. His name is Clyde Best, and uh, most people who are from England or followed uh, British uh, version of soccer uh, in the late uh, 60s and early 70s certainly know uh, Clyde Best from uh, his uh, notable days at West Ham United. Uh, but in the 1975-ish era, uh, came to the United States to play for a brand new team in the then-fledgling North American Soccer League called the Tampa Bay Rowdies and uh, embarked from there on out into a uh, quite um, uh, notable career uh, scoring goals and uh, winning over fans here in the United States, playing both outdoor and indoor soccer. Uh, not only Tampa Bay Rowdies, but also the Portland Timbers for a bunch of years in the late 70s and early 80s. Outdoors with the uh, Toronto Blizzard as well, but also um, a quick study uh, in the indoor game, both the NASL flavors, that's the Tampa Bay Rowdies in 76, uh, the Timbers played indoors in 80 and 81, uh, the Blizzard played uh, indoors in 81, 82. Uh, and then full time for indoor soccer, which is a whole nother story, right? Became because frankly, indoor soccer became the only soccer professionally really in the United States at that time um, with the Cleveland Force and uh, the Los Angeles Lasers, Mr. Best played with. And all of those uh, interesting ports of call uh, are on the docket for today's conversation with Clyde Best, uh, who we talked to from the sunny shores of Bermuda, his native country. Uh, and boy, in this sort of up and down, cold and clammy spring here in Chicago, uh, we certainly wouldn't mind uh, a trade of, of locales for this conversation. However, we had to do it through the means of our communications uh, uh, equipment, and um, uh, it is what it is. So what can we tell you? Uh, Clyde's uh, autobiography is out. It's been out for about six months. It is called The Acid Test, the autobiography of Clyde Best. Uh, it is available wherever good books are sold. You can go to our website at Good Seats stillavailable.com uh, to grab a copy. Uh, you can also get an electronic copy via um, Amazon Kindle. Uh, it is published by De Cupertine Books. I highly recommend the read, especially after you give a listen to our conversation with Clyde Best here on the program. The idea of our podcast is to uh, explore some of the things uh, in in teams and leagues, especially in the United States, that um, are no longer with us, and uh, and certainly mm. uh, you've had some some tremendous experiences here in the U.S. But um, before we even get to that, um, do you want to sort of give uh, give our listeners a bit of background, especially those in the United States who are are more familiar with your career in the NASL and the MISL? We'll get to that, but um, you know, you're you're mm. obviously uh, you obviously uh, came out of uh, of Bermuda as frankly one of uh, Bermuda's most lauded uh, football stars, uh, going to England first, correct? 
Right, yes. I um, left Bermuda when I was 17 and um, went over to England and um, had a trial with West Ham and they liked what they saw, so they kept me and um, I signed for them. Well, uh, you're you're being a little bit modest because uh, you you stayed there for for quite quite some time and and obviously well regarded as a uh, as one of the legacy players of that team. Yes, yes, it was a, you know it was a good long time. Um, it probably could have been a bit longer. Um, it was lovely um, to play in the same team as the three World Cup players and play on a regular base was great. Um, we were a good team. We played good football and. Uh, you know, we were brought up through the great Ron Greenwood, who, uh, you know, wanted us to play attractive football, and that's what we try to do. Um, you know, when I look at the game today, I feel if it was back in our day, we probably could have won a league championship because, you know, in those days, not many teams wanted to play the way we wanted to play, you know. Well, how how did you get on the radar of West Ham in the first place? Because you're coming from a, 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 a tiny country, not only geographically, but also... Mm in terms of, of world football, right? But but p- players like yourself and uh, the uh, equally great uh, Randy Horton, which is known to some of our listeners as well, mm-hmm. I mean, you two kind of broke the mold and and and, and kind of, uh, I don't want to say escaped Bermuda, but but made some real impact outside of Bermuda on the world stage. How did you get to West Ham? Well, before, before us two, um, we had one or two people that had gone over before um, a fellow named Junior Mallory, he played for Cardiff City. Um, Bummy Simons played for Rochdale. Um, Randy and I just picked the baton up and, you know, carried it, you know, for the length of time that we did. Um, Randy was at the Cosmos. I was in England and um, we had Carlton Pepe Deal who played in Houston. We've had Johnny Newsom who played in, I think it was um, Philadelphia. Pink Lewis was in Philadelphia. Um, Dale Russell was in Dallas. So, you know, at that time, football in our country was um, at a very high standard, and we had very, very good players. Um, you know, but our things have changed all of a sudden, and, um, you know, we're not what we used to be. But hopefully we can get back there one day. Well, uh, certainly. So before we get into sort of your... your uh transfer, if you will, from from West Ham to the United States. I I do want to actually speak a bit to your early dalliances with the United States, because when you're with uh, West Ham United, um, you actually kind of got your first taste of the United States and its, I don't know, fragile, shall we say, relationship with soccer uh, in 1969, playing in this uh, championship cup with the old five team at the time, NASL. Do you remember your first impressions of of that five team league and, and perhaps maybe even questioning whether soccer was even going to be a thing here in the United States? Well, I've always felt that, you know, soccer would do well in the uh, United States because when you look at uh, the amount of people that have come from football and countries that have been in the United States. And even though we weren't born there, you know, we still had a passion for the game and, you know, a lot of these players, uh, people like Pushkas had been to the United States. As a matter of fact, when I was a young player in Bermuda, you know, I was told that he wanted me to come play with his team, you know. But um, through Phil Wooslam, who was the um, commissioner of the NASL in those days, and um, Ron Greenwood and our coach here, Graham Adams, you know, they made it possible for me to go to our England. But as I said, I've always had a strong feeling and a strong passion for football in the United States, you know? Well, okay. So, but in 1969, you're with West Ham and you're, you're, you're playing here in the United States in the summer. You're essentially taking on the name of a, of a, of a team in Baltimore called the Bays. And you're basically asked to, uh, essentially, I guess, take on, uh, the persona of a team or a name. Uh, but basically it's the Mm. West Ham team playing in this, in this little championship cup. Uh, do you remember, Anything mm. from those first uh, from those first games? I I know you had an injury relatively right. early, but you mm. you did make some impression, no? Yes, I remember. I think my first game was against um, Wolverhampton Wanderers, and um, I think we beat them three two that night. If my mind um, is correct, and I think it is, um, you are correct. I think I ended up scoring one or two that night, uh, and that was my first 
introduction to playing for the first team. Um, what our coach used to do in those days, he used to, you know, our players that he reckoned were going to be good enough, you know, he would always take us on tour with the first team and to be able to go to Baltimore and play in Baltimore was great, you know, because um, I've always heard about it and I'd heard about the Baltimore Bays and um, it was nice to go there and, um, you know, play against them in that city, you know. Well, it's interesting because um, uh, based on my uh, research, a game, that game against Wolverhampton and, and was actually in the United States known as the Kansas City Spurs, right? But obviously it's Right, it's right. Wolves, Wolves mm-hmm. versus West Ham. Um, you know, it, I think according to the records that I've seen, you had just barely over five thousand people at that game, yeah, and yeah. anywhere else in the world, certainly England, but perhaps even elsewhere in the soccer knowledgeable world, you'd have in excess of mm. fifty thousand for that kind of game. So, did did you feel like mm. something was a little bit amiss, or were you kind of like, no, oh, this is maybe just a, a a growing and early stage kind of thing in the United States? Well, we knew it was going to be a growing concern, and it was something that was going to take time. You know, our main reason for coming was to come um, at the end of the season, you know, and um, give the players some experience that don't play on a regular basis in the first team and to play in this competition, you know. And as I said, um, I mean, for me as a young person, it was great because I think I – we ended all the way going to L.A. and playing and playing in uh, Oakland. And, you know, I'm a baseball fan as well. So to play at those, some of those stadiums where the great baseball players play was unbelievable, you know. Well, so clearly it had some, some effect because uh, you, you did uh, clearly make the first team on a regular basis when you went back to the uh, the full West Ham season in 69 and 70. Um, yeah, but, see? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. Yeah, he must have seen something from the tour <laughs> that made him understand that I was ready, you know, to uh, go forward. You know, um, as I try, I tell people all the time, the most important thing for me is to, I always remember I went to West Ham at 17, and I think it was less than a year for me to get into the first team. So for me, that was unbelievable, you know, and uh, especially be coming from a place like Bermuda, to be going playing on the big stage with all those players, and uh, it was unbelievable, you know. Well, I think it's unbelievable for anybody, even even in even in today's mm. even in today's uh, <laughs> soccer world. Um, well, right. so but so fast forward a year uh, in 1970, you were back in the United States, and uh, perhaps with a, a bit more passion and fervor in the stands. Do you remember the game that you played uh, against Santos and Pele in uh, in September of '70? Yes. Uh, what yeah, you, I'll never forget that. Yeah. All right. Um, what do you What do you remember? That was yes, I remember. Uh, at the end of the game, Pele scored two, and I scored two, and um, he was always out of mind. Him and Eusebio, and to be playing against him for the first time, you know, you're like a little kid, you know, because you're playing against your idol. And what I really liked about him at the end of the game he came up to me and he said i'm the king you're the prince and that was unbelievable you know for him to say that and i whenever i played against him i always made it a point of trying to score a goal which i did every time we played whether he was with the cosmos or you know when he was with santos and that night in particular was a great night because i think santos were world champions and um you know we were playing against sam and some of the best players in the world at that time, um, uh, the guys that were playing for Brazil, Carlos Alberto, Pelé, um, the little left winger, I forget his name right now, Edu. You know, they were great, great players, you know. So it was great, an honor and a pleasure to play against them. Well, it must have been kind of a heady experience. I mean, here you are, I think you were, what, 19 years old at, during that game? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it was, yeah. Probably been 19, yeah. And it was also... Yeah, um, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, I mean, you know, as a soccer player or any professional player, you know, once you're thrown in at the lion's den, you've got to react. And you, if you don't react, you're not going to be there very, very long. You know, it's like they say in the NFL, that stands not for long, you know, if you don't perform. And soccer is no different, you know. So uh, you can't be afraid. 
You know, um, I tell people all the time, the bigger the crowd for me, the better it was, because I like to play in front of big, big crowds, because you want to show people what you're capable of doing. Well, and and, and that game, uh, for those who uh, have not done the research as, uh, as uh, we have here, uh, it was a jam-packed uh, uh, Randall's Island uh, uh, Downing Stadium in Randall's Island, just outside of New York, uh, Manhattan, a uh, game at over 22,000 yeah. for that game. And you uh, recount it um, uh, quite vividly in, in your book, which we'll, we'll talk about in a, in a minute, um, as a steam mm. bath. And, and, but it was also, frankly, it's, it was a real uh, almost 180 degree uh, turn from playing in front of 5,000 people in a 50,000 seat stadium a year, a year earlier. So perhaps there was something going on there, maybe that the United States was really taking to this, especially when you had two superb teams and superb players playing and the U.S. was uh, U.S. crowds well, were appreciative. As I said, with the population of foreign people and Brazilian people in New York, I mean, you mentioned Pele's name. In those days, I mean, people are going to flock to the stadium. I mean, you had two of the best players in the world at that time playing at, at the same venue, and that was Bobby Moore and Pele. And, uh, you know, that was a easy ticket sale. You know, I mean, I remember we even had people like Telly, uh, not Telly, no, not Telly Savelle, it's, um, um James Bond. Um, Roger Moore? Gentleman. He was, I think he was. Oh, Sean Connery. Game. Thank you, Gordon. No, not Roger Moore. The, Sean Connery? Um, the first one, the Scotsman. Um, Sean Connery. Sean Connery. He was there, you know, and he used to come to a lot of our games because him and Bobby Moore were, were good friends. So for people to come to that game that night, you know, it was like a big Broadway play, you know, and uh, you had some of the best players in the world on the big, big stage. And I think we entertained New York pretty well that night. I, I think so. I mean, um, based on my uh, my research, there was uh, there were not only four goals scored in the game. I mean, twice uh, you had uh, a Pele scoring in the first half and you in a span of two minutes scored uh, two goals to to tie it up, so it must have been a, a not a frenzied, uh, a frenzied experience. Yes, it was. It was. As I said, the, I remember the stadium being a small stadium that night. Um, I think you said it was twenty something. It held twenty something, but I think they got a bit more in that night. Might have been close to thirty. You know, um, it was back to the rafters. You know, and um, it was great to be a part of it. You know, and as I said, when you ever mention that name. LA, it's an honor to be on the same pitch as him, you know. Well, so obviously that, uh, you know, you continue to do uh, quite well on the first team with West Ham and, and for, for a number of years, uh, certainly your mm. ups and downs as a player and, and, and some of the other uh, issues that you had to deal with. But maybe we could sort of fast forward to 1975 when, you know, you're, you've got the, uh, the FA Cup with, with West Ham and, and you're essentially mm. a, a reserve and, and maybe looking at sort of other things out there, including perhaps the United States again. But do you want to kind of tell us yeah, our yeah. And, and I know you talk about this in the book, but and I don't want to give all of it away. But do you kind of want to maybe mm. recount to our listeners a little bit of what was sort of going on with with you as a player and, and just as a person circa 1975 and perhaps why you would even consider leaving England for a place like the United States to continue to play? Well, I think, first of all, you know, as a player, you want to be there in the big, big matches. And to miss out on an FA Cup, you know, that's a disappointment because, you know, that's what you play all your life for. And at that particular time, you know, I had played in the quarterfinals but didn't play in the finals. I'm in the semifinals, and obviously, you know, there was no room for the final. It was between me and a good friend of mine, Patsy Allen, and funny, I set up the goal for Pensy in the semifinal, in the quarterfinal. So he kept his place. And when it was time for me, you know, to get in, I wasn't able to get in. So, you know, obviously that didn't make me happy because I wanted to play. You know, and, um, you know, I had uh, an agent in England at the time, the same general that Bowie Moore had. And, you know, he had told me about the United States and... Um, Graham, um, Eddie Fomani was a coach then, and, um, you know, he wanted to know if I wanted to come to America and, you know, just, you know, get fit and get ready to come back to England the next year, which I did. And, um, you know, I went over to Tampa 
and uh, it was great. I mean, I fell in love with the place instantly. You know. So this and, was um, this was this was basically set up originally as a loan for the summer in 1975 yes. for you to come to Tampa Bay, not as a full transfer. Yes. No, it was a loan the first, and um, as I said, Eddie Fumani was there. He took a bunch of us over from good, good players from England. Um, people like Paul Hammond, who was a goalkeeper, Crystal Palace, Mark Lindsay, mm-hmm. played Crystal Palace, Johnny Sissons played with me at West Ham, Johnny Boyle played at Chelsea, Derek Smithers was at Chelsea. So we had a pretty decent team, you know, and I said to myself, well, here's a new adventure. It's time, you know, it's an opportunity for me to go to America and help grow the sport there. And we ended up going to Tampa. And when we first started, it was like in Baltimore, not many people. Right. But by the time we were ready to finish, we were getting like 55,000 people. So you say to yourself, hey, you know, something's happened here, you know, and we went on to win the championship that year. Um, we beat the Portland Timbers um, in the final. And it was great, great. You know, it was a great atmosphere. The people were great. The club were great. The fans were unbelievable, you know, and um, you couldn't help but, you know, take that sort of stuff in, you know, and it was a marvelous time. And I'm glad I had the opportunity to do it because, as I said, a lot of people like myself, your Pele, your Sabios, your Randy Hortons, you know, we know deep down inside, we hope to put America's soccer where it is today. I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, you scored, uh, apparently you scored that uh, second insurance goal of the Soccer Bowl in 75. And actually, that that was a, that that final, I mean, talk about a magical season, right? That's it's Tampa Bay's first, mm-hmm. year, first year in the league, right? Uh, That's right. Yeah. Brand, new, brand new stadium in Tampa. And, uh, and you make it all the way to the mm-hmm. final and win. And and a national televised mm. audience as well, which is rare or hadn't happened in a number of years in the, in this country. Oh um, yes, it was it was unbelievable. I mean, um, it was an unbelievable time. As I said, the people treated us like royalty. You know, anything we wanted, you know, was done for us. So you couldn't help but fall in love with the city and the place and. You know, um, Tampa is still one of my favorite places today, you know, and um, it was just a great, great time. And as I said, all the players we had, you know, made it easy. And, um, you know, we were able to go on and reward the city with the first ever um, championship, you know, of any type. All right. Well, mm. so so let's let's talk about um, let's talk about some of the other reasons why you decided ultimately to leave permanently for Tampa Bay. I mean, <clears throat> anybody who's read your uh, your book and obviously we want to make sure that we. Uh, we promote it. It's called The Acid mm. Test, the autobiography of, of Clyde Best. Right. And it is available wherever good mm. books are sold, and hopefully we'll get it uh, maybe help promote, promote it a little bit to get uh, published here in the United States as well. But The, mm. acid, the acid Test uh, is, is only a play on words, but it's also uh, it, it, it encapsulates some of the underlying issues that were, uh, frankly, bedeviling you uh, as a player in England. Uh, mm. And maybe you want right. to sort of talk a bit about that because it's a – it's a big issue that, um, you know, in many respects, um, still hasn't fully, you know, uh, unwound itself from from the from the pro game, unfortunately. Mm. Well, um, yeah, the acid test comes from um, one day I was going through my fan mail and someone decided to send me a hate mail that said that when I went on to the field, they were going to throw acid test acid into my face. So when it was time to write the book, the ghostwriter got to me and said, hey, that's a great name, and we named it The Acid Test. But um, as I said, it was a funny thing to have had happen. And um, as I said, I, I think that particular game, I never stopped running. I must have run for 120 minutes, you know, because you didn't want to stand still in case something happened, you know. And um, I must, um, you know, I would always congratulate the club and, the um, police, because they've done a fantastic job to protect me, to make sure nothing really happened, you know, and lucky enough, you know, it was okay, and, you know, I was able to get through it without any um, scrapes or anything like that, you know. But as, you know, being in England in those days, that was a part of the football, you know, people 
would do things to you to probably try to intimidate you and get you off your game. And my thing was always that <clears throat> I wasn't playing for myself. I was playing for all the people that were coming after me and the people that worked in the low and paying jobs and everything like that to let them know that you can, you know, get to the top if you put your heart and soul into it. But but that 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 blatant let's be honest, that blatant racism and, 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 and situations as explicit as that, uh, that had to unnerve mm. you on, on some level. I mean, that, that can't not affect you in some way. Well, right? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, my club, the Club West Ham is a great, great club. And what I would always say about them is that we were one of the first clubs in England to play three black players at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was Eddie Coker, Clive Charles, and myself. And so, look, funny enough, we all ended up playing in the NASL. Indeed. And um, we, you know, we took it in a stride. You know, we knew what to expect. You know, and um, it's like um, when Eddie first played his game, you know, I used to tell him, you know, the way to silence the crowd is to put the ball into the back of the net. And if you do something brilliant and... You you put the ball in the back of the net. What could they say? <laughs> They're going to say nothing to you, you know. So that's what we try to do, and in lots of cases we did do that, you know. And um, as I say, you got to be big, you got to be strong. If they get on top of you, they're winning, aren't they? So you just got to continue playing and doing what you can, because at the end of the day, the game has to be the winner, you know. Well, that's uh, that, that's. Uh tremendous insight uh, and wisdom but um, uh, you know again I, I think you know it takes a uh, a brave and courageous soul to to sort of uh, uh, approach it that way because you can imagine how uh, well we can all imagine how how difficult and, and unnerving um, that kind of environment could be but so all right when you get to Tampa though in the United States I, I mm. it feels to me that that the idea of of sort of you know the the racial undertones and and some of those difficulties were, I wouldn't say magically dissipated, but probably wasn't as pronounced, perhaps, maybe as it was in England when you were playing there. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, I'm not going to say it didn't exist. If it did, you know, it wasn't shown very much. And um, you had a job to do, you know. And as I said, um, whatever, what happened in England, as I said, you had to be strong. Not anybody could do that. You have to be of a certain character. And as I said, the club were tremendous. Lots of times they never looked at what color you were. They just wanted a good soccer player. And um, in most cases, you know, that's what we turned out, you know. And um, as I said, I had great teammates, you know, and Bobby Moore used to talk to me all the time, Jeff, Billy Bonds, you know, and uh, these are the people that made sure you done what you had to do. And, um, you know, you you knew um, what you had to perform for and the way you went about your job, you know, made it a big difference, you know. Well, when you're in Tampa, uh, you for good, you came back not to play outdoors to start, but you came to play this sort of odd little game called indoor soccer uh, that you yes. uh, quickly, quickly uh, excelled at as well. Um, do you want to kind of maybe <laughs> talk about sort of your experiences playing on the indoor game in 76? Probably for the first time. Well, in '76, huh? Mark, Lindsay, and I, um, we decided Tampa is the place to go, you know, because we were treated so well. Sure. The people in Tampa was great to us, and we said we're going to make the move, you know. And I went in to see my manager. He went in to see his manager, and you know, you know, I told him that you know it was time to go to Tampa, you know, because I liked it and that's where I wanted to be to try to make a difference and. As I said, playing indoor, if you can play the game of football, you can play anywhere. And the way we were brought up at West Ham, he always told us if we were in our living room and we had to move the, our furniture, <laughs> you should be able to, uh, you know, play a game. And that's the way we went about doing our things. The game calls for good technique. You've got to have a good touch and you've got to be willing to work. And if you have them throwing things indoor, most people can play because, you know, it's all about ball control, being able to pass the ball. It's a small area, but a lot of the principles are the same. And I enjoy playing indoor. It was nice. 
in and out, you know, a bit like hockey, and you've done your job, and, you know, you worked at it, you know. Um, how, how quickly did you adapt to it? I, I guess pretty well, but, I mean, look, in that, that period of didn't, time, in that period of time, it was it a... It didn't take pr- me... Yeah. It didn't take me any time at all. Huh. No time at all, because, as I said, we played a lot of five side in England. You know, in the wintertime, lots of times when you can't get outside, you go to a gym and you play, you know three aside, five aside, it's the same thing, you know. So that's what a lot of people don't understand. They seem to think that, um, you know, indoor, you know, is uh, a big, big difference from outdoor. You still got to put your foot to ball, you know what I mean? And you got to control it, you know. And um, if and, you and, do those things, and the re- indoor is a double. And the rebounding and, and the, 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 the plexiglass. Yeah, and the- you- that didn't bother yeah, you? you get used to all of that. You get used to all of that. It's Lots of times it's just like playing a ball pass, you know, with another person. You know, if you know you know how to use the board, you get the ball back from the boards, and lots of times you end up scoring goals that way, you know. Well, you, but you I make, must say it's a bit faster, you know. Well, you make it sound easy, but, uh, you know, let the records uh, show that uh, not only were you <laughs> – <laughs> not only was Tampa Bay the champions of the in, of the indoor uh, league that year, but you yeah. were also the MVP of the of the championship series, and you were the leading scorer. Uh, so you – Yeah, clearly... yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, it comes from all your upbringing at a place like West Ham. We were known as a footballing club. We like to play football and – you want to hear the pat of the ball when you're passing it, you know, pat, pat, pat. You know, you don't want to see the ball growing up 60 feet in the sky and can't get it. That's why we call it a football. You put it down on the carpet and you play. And if you have good technique, then you can play the game anywhere if you if you have good technique. All right, so so later that summer, obviously, you play back outdoors again with, with Tampa Bay and, and, and mm. some, some pretty amazing – games with the Cosmos, you, you kind of touched on it a little earlier, but do you remember anything about the two games, both Tampa and in um, uh, in New York, uh, against the, well, the Cosmos? Well, I remember the Tampa game because I think it was Giorgio Canelli's, Giorgio Pelé and Franz Beckenbauer's first game. Correct. And I think we played them on national television, and we gave them a good hide, and we beat them like 5-1. That's right. And it was an unbelievable game. I mean, it was national television. Rodney Marsh was here with us then. He was doing these tricks, and he was a dream player to play with, Rodney, because he made it so easy. And he had brilliant technique for a big fella. And um, he was sitting on the board and all that. But what we forgot, that we had to go to New York the next Wednesday. And we were beating them... 3-1 3-1 at half time. I think I scored a hat trick. You did? Uh, yes. And lo and behold, Pele must have gone to the dressing room. I don't know what he told the Cosmos. But when they came out in the second half, it was a different bunch of guys. They ended up beating us 5-3. You know, and it was an unbelievable game, you know. And I'll never forget my friend Mark Lindsay. He was picked up Pele. And Pele picked this ball up outside our box, outside of their box. And he looks up on, in the field and he sees Tony Field. Mm-hmm. And he hit this ball 40 yards over Tony Field's shoulder right into his path. And Tony continued to run down the wing. Pele went right down the middle. Mark went with him. And he said, as he got outside the box, Pele shouted, go. And the ball came over and he headed the ball into the net. And we couldn't believe it, you know, but that's what playing against Pelé was like. Only he could do that sort of stuff, you know, but it was a great uh, competition and it was always a great game when Tampa Bay played the Cosmos. Did you guys did you guys remember the game only, what, four or five years earlier that you were playing against each other? Well, we didn't know before, you know, I mean, because when we came over, they weren't there, you know, Pelé back and more. You know, I think after New York, after we start doing, Tampa started doing well, New York, you know, got the people in that had the money and they were able to bring the big, big stars that were from Europe. I mean, when you look at the stars that the Cosmos had, most of them probably could have gone to Europe and continued to play. You know, you had people like Beeskins, uh, Reisbergen, who were played with in Holland. You had um, uh, Giorgio. You had Pelé, Carlos Alberto. Sure. I mean, they had unbelievable 
talent at New York. I mean, I think Dennis Tudor, uh, Tudor, you had the little boy Hunt who got into his groove, and so they were an unbelievable team, you know. So you mentioned uh, Rodney Marsh. Um, so mm. there's a little bit of a hint in the book, and, and I, maybe we can address this once and for all. Were you responsible for bringing mm. Rodney Marsh to, to Tampa Bay in the first place? Yes, I was. Yes, I was. I knew Rod, at the time I was in England, Rodney was at Manchester City, and I knew he was on his way out of city. So I phoned my people in Tampa and told them, look, let's get this guy. He can play. Come and get him. So one of our, our general managers at the time was a guy called Bo Rogers. Mm-hmm. And Bo came over, and we watched him play the game in Crystal Palace one night. And him and I went, and uh, we saw him. Bo liked him, and he took him there, there and then, made arrangements for him to come over to America. Mm-hmm. And he's still there, from what I understand. I hear him every day on uh, Sirius there, XM. Yeah, he loves it. Last time I spoke to him, he was there still. And uh, he loves it there. You know, I think his children might have gone back to England, but him and his wife. You know, they love it, yeah. I mean, as a matter of fact, a lot of the guys that we played with in Temper are still there. You know, they liked it, fell in love with it, and end up staying. Yeah, Rodney hosts a uh, a show, a, a thrice-weekly show uh, called Grumpy Pundits here in the United States on Sirius XM mm. Satellite. And uh, uh, it's great to, to hear him sort of regale not only in today's stories, but uh, the stories in the past. All right, so... Um, right, right. So, so Tampa was a wonderful experience, but but yet you wound up in Portland by way of a Dutch team. Um, you want to maybe walk us through a little bit of that and and your experiences in Portland well, well, as well. I went, to, I went to Portland first because Brian Taylor, Brian um, Tyler, who was the manager then, he um, liked the way Stuart and I played. Stuart um, Scullion. Sure. So he came in and got Stuart and I and. Eddie, you know, um, up until now, they tell me he's really realized that he made a big mistake by letting us go. And But Brian came in and he let us go to Tampa. And we ended up in the Northwest and ended up falling in love with Tampa, you know, <laughs> uh, um, Portland. Um, From one, ex- one extreme to the other, right? It was a great city. Yep, what's that? One extreme to the other, weather-wise, right? Yes, yes. But it was a great city. Um, I think it's probably one of the best places in America if you want to raise a family and stuff like that. You know, it's a, it was a great city, great people. We met lots of friends who we're still friends with today. And, um, you know, it's something and a place that we'll never forget, you know. Have you um, have you been uh, keeping tabs on the uh, the current iteration of the Portland Timbers franchise? It seems like they've really embraced. I watch them now. Past. I try to watch them now and again. You know, I haven't, you know, I see they won a championship a few years ago, or two years ago, wasn't yes. it? Yeah, and it's, you know, it was nice to see them win because Portland is a footballing city. They're crazy there about the football, and uh, apparently they still are today. So it's nice to see the franchise still doing well. I just wish Tampa can pick up a little bit and get up where Portland is, you know. Well, Major League Soccer certainly has uh, thrown down the gauntlet for uh, expansion and, and, and the, the rules by which they're going to, to bring teams back in. And obviously, Tampa had its mm. its opportunity in the early part of MLS, but um, perhaps the Rowdies franchise in USL now can uh, can rise uh, rise up and uh, get its stadium situation all together and, and potentially get back into MLS. It would be interesting to see. Um, yeah, it would be interesting because it's a great football in the city and the people there, you know, will support. You know, it's been proven that they can do it, and I'm sure they still have a large fan base, you know, in um, Tampa at the present time, you know. So um, aside from your NASL exploits, um, I think one of the areas that uh, is really not uh, really talked about much in your career is your extensive uh, indoor career, uh, especially with uh, teams in the uh, major indoor soccer league. Um, you want to give you want to give our audience a bit of a sense of of how you started to play more regularly and then full time as an indoor player versus staying either in the well, NASL I, here in the United States. Well, my on my first indoor venture was in Tampa Bay. Yeah, and once I went to Tampa Bay, I went to Portland, and 
a good friend of mine out in Hudson who was playing in Seattle at the time. They'd give me a call and said, Eddie McCready is in Cleveland. And he was looking for players, so he was going to tell him about me. And I had played against Eddie at Chelsea, you know, when I was young. And, sure. Um, Alan, and they knew what my capabilities were like. So I ended up going to Cleveland for um, a few months before the NAFL season started back in Portland. So I went to Cleveland, and, you know, it was nice. Eddie was brilliant, great guy. And uh, we went there, you know, but I had to go back to Portland. Um, to get ready for the start of the season, but my time in Port, I'm in Tampa, I'm not Tampa, I'm in uh, Cleveland, it was great, you know, and Eddie is a person that I admire, and would always, he was a great coach, and, um, you know, he was a great person to play uh, for and against, you know. Do you still have any of those uh, Cleveland Force uniforms? They were probably the most colorful and garish uh, uniforms <laughs> in the MISL. No, I don't have any... Um, I don't have any. Those were the uh, white and different colors. And yeah, then we was, had a black one, if I remember. Yeah, I think there was also and, yellow uh, and yellow and blue. And, and yeah, if, yeah. if people look online, they, there's this, some, uh, this this logo of a person with sort of the force. I guess it was uh, influenced by the Star Wars uh, movie franchise. Is but, that right? But they yes, took... I don't know. Um, yeah, if you... There was if, a gentleman named Bart Weinstein and his son, Scott, that owned the team in those days. And they were great people, you know, so... You know, if they're still going along, you know, if they're listening, uh, you know, hey, thanks a lot for those wonderful, wonderful times, you know. Uh, okay, so how did you uh, uh, talk to me about your uh, MISL exploits in uh, in Los Angeles then, right? Because that was really kind of the last playing that you did in, in, in the United States. But the L.A. Lasers were probably a little, I don't know, a little less well supported maybe than even Cleveland was indoors. No, well, we got in. Uh, I got in L.A. through Peter Wall, who used to coach at um, um, California Surf. California and, Surf, um, yes. And he played at Crystal Palace. So uh, my friend Clive, this time Clive Charles, knew about the um, them playing in the um, forum and uh, at the Lasers, and it was owned by Jerry Buss's uh, children at the time. I think John and a friend of his owned the team. So Peter gave me a call and wanted me if I wanted to come to um, L.A. Now I had a choice between L.A. and Toronto. Well, Toronto was so cold in the winter, that was a no-brainer, you know, <laughs> so, because I, had tired of, I was tired of being in the, I was tired of being in the cold in Toronto, so I went from Toronto to L.A. once Peter, you know, came in for me. Uh, and do you remember anything about your uh, uh, the the games at the uh, at the LA Forum? Uh, uh, not well attended, if I remember correctly, but um, a good three well, years of playing. At right? times, we we got pretty good crowds. You know, as the team started to win, you know, I mean, you know, I would say at times we got like eighteen thousand, twenty thousand people. You know, once we started to do good, you know, um, because LA is a city of champions and. You just can't throw anything in that league because the people are used to winning, you know. And um, um, you know, it would have been nice if we, if they could team could have done better, you know. But a lot of times, it depends on the quality of players that you have. They will determine that, you know. If we had a guy like Stankovic or the one that used to play for the team in New York or Zongo, you know, probably would have been a different thing, you know. Mm. So uh, since you had extensive experience playing both brands of indoor soccer in the U.S., any, any, uh, um, mm. any remembrances of, of sort of the difference in, in play uh, between the NASL and the MISL besides the color of the ball? Not really. I mean, it was basically the same. Hey, put your foot on the ball, control it, make a nice pass to your opponent. You know, um, the rules were practically the same when you had a fast break. A bit like hockey, you took advantage of it. You know, if you got numbers up, like uh, three-on-one or three-on-two, you try to take advantage of it. So it was basically the same in the NASL as um, in the um, MLS. Um, I just think the MLS played a bit longer, and I think they're still playing today. Am I correct? In the MLS? MLS, of course. Um... Yes, they're still going now. So, 
you know, they've been there for a long, long time. So for them, you know, it's a lot easier. But I think, as I said previously, if you can play the game of football, you can play anywhere if you've got the right uh, credentials. Well, uh, your experiences in the U.S., I mean, you played for a number of teams, both outdoor and indoor, and obviously mm. adapted very well to the American culture and lifestyle. Um, mm. Did you ever wonder during the 70s and 80s, I mean, look, you were, you were playing for different teams, uh, not all of them stable or, or, or lived on after you left them. Uh, did you ever worry mm. about sort of uh, how rooted, uh, as substantially rooted the game was going to be? And did you ever worry about the league or the teams that you were playing with uh, not being around or not lasting a long period of time? Not really, because I've always felt that if we get to the kids and we coach the kids properly, those are going to be the ones that are going to take it to the next step, you know, and that has happened. I mean, when I, once I finished playing, I went to coach in high school you know, and um, from high school, I went to a junior college. And a lot of my boys ended up playing and playing competitive in the leagues. You know, um, one of them played for the U.S., uh, little Joe Max Moore. Sure. You know, so these players have, you know, continued the process, you know, because what I try and tell young players all the time, the game is going to be here longer than all of us. So let's try to leave our mark somewhere, you know, and that's what life's all about, you know, because nothing's forever, especially in professional sports. You could be here today and go on tomorrow. So you have to try and make your mark where you can. And um, that's what life's all about. So, you know, I'm grateful for having the opportunity to come to Bermuda. I'm come to the U S and give something to them. And as I said, I, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job. Well, I think you're being modest. Um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, it's clear. Well, that's just the way I am, you know. <laughs> to me, when you achieve things, anybody that goes off and totes his mouth off, he's got something wrong with him. You know, once you're done what you have to do, you don't have to do that sort of stuff, you know. Well, and I, I, this is the way I am, you know, laid back, reserved, and you let a lot of people read up and look and see what they, what you've done. And, you know, you try and let them make that assessment, you know. I know deep down inside I've done the best I could, and, you know, that's what life's all about. Well, I do, um, <clears throat> I do think it's a testament to players like yourself uh, who, mm. you know, truly were pioneers in this country in particular, right, in the 70s and early 80s. Right. Uh, mm. In that, you know, you have a very successful and stable Major League Soccer now. You have a two divisions of, of minor league soccer underneath uh, right. MLS. Mm. And you also have now teams that uh, have uh, uh, reignited uh, the uh, original names from uh, right. two, two of the franchises that you well, played I'm glad for. for that. Yeah, I'm glad for that. You know, I'm glad we still have the Portland Timbers and I'm glad we still have the Rowdies. You know, that's a good sign because that tells you the longevity of the football in the United States, you know, and I just hope it continues to grow. And as I said, we keep working on the children and making sure they become educated and make sure they're coached in the right manner so it can get better. I would hope, I would like to, before I close my eyes, to see them win a World Cup. It could happen. You don't know, you know. Well, there are a lot of people in this country who've been kind of uh, long suffering and waiting for that to happen and, and seems to be some fits and starts. But, I, you know, I think you're right. I mean, I look, the idea that that team names from 20, 30, 40 years ago are being resurrected mm. and used and and as being as real roots and real history, you know, in a in a country yes, that is. is historically not a soccer nation, although, you know, historians will say that it's been played for for many, many, many years. But on a grand yeah. scale, it hasn't. And and. That's a testament to players like you um, breaking the mold and, and, and making things happen in this country uh, when it wasn't necessarily so guaranteed or so sure. Well, I'm glad we had the opportunity to do it. And as I said, I've always been a person that if I'm going to go somewhere to make a difference, I'm glad to be a part of it. And that's what we were during those uh, years in the NASL, you know, to help something grow and something to get better. And as I said, um, my most important thing, um, most of the kids that I have, 
They've all been to college. They've all got educated. And when I see stuff like that happen, you know, that makes me happy, you know? Well, it would make me happy if uh, the if uh, Toronto FC, uh, if the Tampa Bay Rowdies at the Portland Timbers would uh, would bring back Mr. Best for any and all reunion games and uh, perhaps uh, some some remembrances of, of his uh, his uh, tremendous uh, playing careers in each of those places. Um, so there's the open well, invitation. I, for would never pro- I wouldn't have a problem going to that. You know, that's something they would have to decide to do. Um, as I said, I speak to my friend Mark um, Lindsay, you know, quite often. As a matter of fact, I'm hoping to try and bring him on for a golf tournament that I have in Bermuda with my foundation for kids' education. So, you know, um, if they decide, you know, I would greatly be appreciative and, you know, would follow through and come to whatever they would like to have put on. You know? I, th- I think it would be great. And there's, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of, of players that uh, I'm sure people who – uh, think that soccer was created uh, in their lifetimes would uh, recognize that there was actually history uh, prior to that. Clyde Best, I thank you so much for uh, for being part of our show, and uh, hopefully we'll, a little bit of uh, a little bit of promotion for the book, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you at a uh, at a soccer stadium here in the United States soon to remember some of your uh, your great work on the field and off uh, in the United States. Thanks very much, and tell them don't give up on the USA. We're going to get there one day. Thank you, Clyde. We love that. Uh, awesome. Take okay. care. Okay. Nice talking to you. You Bye-bye. as well. Thanks, Clyde. Bye-bye. Okay, there you have it. There's our chat with uh, Clyde Best, uh, who we thank for joining us uh, from the sunny shores of his home in Bermuda. And uh, I think it's important to remember that, um, you know, Clyde Best, along with uh, Randy Horton and maybe one other, is probably uh, the best a soccer player to ever come out of Bermuda and is obviously uh, revered there as uh, as one of its greatest soccer exports. Um, and uh, no doubt, uh, you know, at, at age 17, playing for uh, First Division West Ham uh, in arguably the uh, best league in the world at the time uh, in England uh, is uh, certainly uh, indicative of, of how good uh, he was uh, certainly in his early years, and of course, uh, in a, uh, a quite successful career in West Ham, uh, and then at a still fairly young age, I think in his sort of not even mid twenties, uh, coming over to the United States and uh, uh, the greener pastures of the fledgling North American Soccer League and, and the game professionally uh, here in the states. So um, some great stories, and, and I did not know, as I tend to learn something in every episode at least, that. Uh, that Clyde was uh, responsible, at least so he says, uh, for uh, bringing Rodney Marsh or getting Rodney Marsh uh, uh, to the Tampa Bay Rowdies uh, here in the States. And, and we've got to get Rodney on a, a future episode to corroborate that story, of course, and, and regale us further with some uh, old Tampa Bay Rowdies uh, memories. So, um, again, Clyde Best, thank you for uh, for joining us. Clyde's uh, book is The Acid Test, uh, the autobiography of Clyde Best. Is published by D. Cooper Teen. I believe it's how you pronounce it, he says, hopefully. Books. Uh, it is uh, out and available now. I know it's been published in the uh, in the UK. Uh, it may soon come to the United States, but um, you can still order it regardless uh, wherever fine books are sold. Or you can go, of course, to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. You will find a link to the book uh, as well as the Kindle digital edition there. Uh, as well as, of course, old episodes of our show and, and, and all kinds of other good stuff about how to get in contact with us, our email address, our email newsletter, uh, as well as, of course, all of our social media feeds, which uh, we encourage you to sign up for at least one of so you can keep in touch with us and, and even communicate with us uh, when it's warranted. And, of course, on Twitter, that's at Good Seats Still. Uh, on uh, Instagram, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. And uh, you'll find us on uh, Facebook. we got a page for this show there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much for joining us. We've got plenty more great uh, episodes to come, lots of great conversations in the hopper. Uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll get our, our first in-person interview. A lot of those coming up and um, just fun, fun stuff coming up. And, and please, indeed, send us your cards and letters and suggestions. We love uh, hearing from our fans and uh, we appreciate you listening. Until then, take care and we'll see you soon.